Let's pray together, shall we, before we begin tonight. Father, as we approach one of the most exciting passages of Scripture, I just ask for complete calm, Father, upon us, that the peace of Jesus may still all the events of the day, and that, Father, we should give ourselves up, even tonight, to the study of the Word of God. Father, we know how central the Word of God is, and, Father, as we approach these last days, it's becoming more and more essential. Father, may we have the reality that the words that I speak tonight may actually be used during the period that we're talking about to perhaps save some people. May we understand, Father, that these tapes that are being produced tonight may go right through into the period of the tribulation and be heard by people experiencing these things. And Father, we're praying in Jesus' name for an anointing. Should that be the case, for an anointing upon all those who listen and hear. Father, please show us that these things are not just theological um, visions, but Father, they are deep reality, and reality which is coming on the earth. Father, we just lift Jesus high. We know, Lord, that today is the day of salvation. We know, Father, that today is the day when grace is freely available. And Father, I pray that we might be more urgent in our evangelism, that we should desire to see people saved. Father, tonight, as we talk about the abomination of desolations, Father, I want to pray in Jesus' name that you will deal with religion in each one of our lives. Father, we know that religion, Father, is the worst thing and the worst enemy of the truth. For, Father, it stops us coming into reality. It is ritual without reality. And, Father, I ask that if there be any religious ways within us, you will deal with those ways so that we come through to the reality of the word of truth, that we might live in the word, and that we might ob obey all your precepts, Father, Father, and all your judgments that are so clearly declared. Father, we ask that you and you alone may be glorified tonight. Just come and walk among us. And Father, will you just make the words scintillating? May they, Father, burn in our hearts, that, Father, we should truly go away from this place and know that we have communed deeply with Jesus tonight. Oh, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Tonight we come to the subject of the 70 weeks of Daniel, the prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Now we're making good progress. We are, of course, in the middle of a course which deals with unfulfilled prophecy or things to come, and we've seen some very, very important uh, principles which we have gone over during the last few weeks. Last time I dared to ask a certain question. The question was, Will the Church of Jesus Christ go through the period which the Bible calls the Tribulation? And I want you to know that not only last week's talk is on that subject, but tonight's talk is really on that subject, and next time's talk as well, because it really is going to take three talks to discuss it. Last time we saw some very important things. Um, we saw, for example, that whenever the Tribulation is talked of in the Old Testament, it's always talked of literally and specifically in terms of the Jewish nation, in terms of Jerusalem, and in terms of the land of Israel. There is absolutely no indication anywhere that the church is going to be involved in that particular period. And you'll remember, having stated that fact, we then went on to see a little more about the mystery of the church. This wonderful principle, which quite clearly stated, says this, that nowhere in the Old Testament is the church specifically mentioned. And in fact, when the, where the church ought to be mentioned, there is just a gap, there is total silence, and history seems to jump straight over it and to carry on as if nothing had happened. All right, we saw certain examples of that. And do you remember the exciting note that we ended on? We saw an amazing thing, that Rome, the Roman Empire, which was but which at the present time isn't anymore, has a future. And that the day is coming when the Roman Empire is going to rise again. It was, it is not, but it is to come. Now all of those things are necessary as we approach tonight's subject of the 70 weeks of Daniel. For this section of Daniel underlines everything that we saw last time. In fact, the 70 weeks of Daniel, the prophecy of the 70 weeks, has been described as the most crucial passage uh, in the field of prophecy. It is, I love it so much, it's only four verses, 
But I love it so much because it's always the, the part of Scripture that gives uh, people who don't take prophecy literally the most trouble. They always come to Daniel 70 weeks and they have to scratch their heads mighty hard over it. In fact, I've been very amused. I did it just this morning. I started reading books that actually take prophecy in a sort of spiritual type of way and I looked up the 70 weeks and some of them didn't deal with it at all. Sort of hoping that if they don't deal with it, no one will notice and pretend it will go away. Others, in fact, one book in particular that I looked at, it didn't just end the book on the Daniel 70 weeks, it put it right at the end of all the additions, the appendices of, to the book, and then it gave it just about one page, one very small page, too, and uh, more or less just dismissed it and said, well, this really, everyone quotes that, but really it's not important, full stop, you know, and just left it like that. I read also a paper written by a man who's looking into the whole millennial issue and he's coming to the conclusion that prophecy shouldn't be taken literally. And right at the end of this thing, do you know what he says? He says, um, concerning Daniel 70 weeks, I haven't come to any conclusions yet. So it's done and left it like that. And that's the way they try and get round it. But of course, people who take the Bible literally, they always turn to this passage. I would say as a rule of thumb, by the way, that if you want to know the standpoint that the author of a book of prophecy takes. Then always look up Daniel 70 weeks first, and after that, then go to Revelation 20, and when you've seen how they deal with those two passages, you will understand exactly what viewpoint they actually take. All right, now we're in Daniel, and Daniel 9, but before we get to the four verses, I want to just set the scene. So let's turn to Daniel and chapter 9, and we'll begin verse 1. We'll begin verse 1. And I'll read verse 1 through. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Now there's the first statement. At this particular time, the Jews have been removed from the land. They've been scattered. You remember that God warned them that if they got badly out of fellowship, that he would actually come along and that he would take drastic action. So drastic, in fact, that at times they will be taken from the land and they will be scattered among the heathen. When Daniel 9 opens, they are scattered among the heathen and, in fact, living in the land of Babylonia. Uh, in 606 BC, Nebuchadnezzar had come along and he'd taken over Jerusalem and had begun taking some of the Jews out from Jerusalem and taking them home to where he lived. And that was part of God's discipline. Here is Daniel. He is living in these days with the Jews still in the land of Babylon, but something dramatic, dramatic has happened. The Babylonian Empire, which had controlled the Jews for 60 odd years, has suddenly overnight been overthrown by the Medes and the Persians. It was the man to remember the name of the Persian uh, king who actually took over the empire. His name was Cyrus the Great. And Cyrus the Great had an uncle who was a very trustworthy man whose name was Darius the Mede. And Darius the Mede was the man that he left in charge of Babylon. And so it says here, in the first year of Darius the Mede. And the date of that, which is very important for us, is 537 BC. Now Daniel at this time was getting on a bit. He was a fairly elderly man. He was also a very um, highly placed political leader in Babylon. And of course we know that he was also the most marvelous and wonderful believer in the Lord. And he was a Bible scholar. And so Daniel realizes that something's happening. And so he turns to the book of Jeremiah and he starts to read some of the prophecies of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah lived before the Jews had gone into Babylon. And Jeremiah, for year after year, preached to the Jews and said, if you persist in your ways, then the God of Israel is going to come along and you will be removed from the land. I warn you. And then, when it occurred, uh, he wrote the history of how uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and took over the Jews. But he didn't stop there. In a remarkable passage in Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah then prophesies. And do you know what he prophesies? He says... This is my announcement to you, Jews. The captivity will last 70 years. 
Now Daniel in, three, in 5, 3, 7 is reading the book of Jeremiah. Verse 2. In the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, this is Daniel 9 verse 2, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And of course, Daniel, when he reads that, he gets very, very excited. Now why does he get excited? Well, let's have a look. The captivity began in 606 BC. Jeremiah said it would last 70 years. Now, if you add 70 years onto 606, you come to 536 BC. Here is Daniel in 537, and he says, Now, he says, the word of the Lord declares that within the next year or so, the end of the captivity is coming. So he gets very excited, you know, as the Bible believers would, and as we do about it. And he says, well, it could be a year, or I'm standing at the beginning of 537, it could be anything up to two years. But in the next one or two years, the end's coming. And so he immediately starts praying. If you just read on, verse 3, and I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Now that's a very important statement because Jeremiah, you see, had said that at the end of the 70 years, people would turn to the Lord and start to pray. And Daniel, reading that, he doesn't just say, oh, well, praise the Lord. God's going to raise up praying women or something like this. He says, if the word of God says at the end of the time people are going to pray, I'm at the end of the time, so I'm going to pray. And so he starts to pray. And he starts pouring his heart out about the, his own sins, about the sins of the Jews, about what they've done in the land, and so it goes on. And more than that, he says to God, God, I'd love to know some more details. In fact, he was saying, Lord, please, will you tell me the day when it comes to an end? That's really what I want to, to know. And his prayer occupies most of Daniel chapter 9. But the answer comes almost as soon as he's prayed. And it comes in the form of a messenger. In fact, uh, the archangel Gabriel appears. The one who would give the message to Mary, by the way, about the coming of Jesus, he appears to Daniel, and he says these wonderful words to Daniel. They're found in verse 21. Verse 21. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, right, it's in the, he's in the form of a man, he's the archangel Gabriel, whom I'd seen at the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter, and consider the vision. And here is the Archangel Gabriel. He is going to answer the prayer immediately. He appears to Daniel and he says, Now I've only got four verses of scripture to give you, but this is the word of the Lord. They may just be four verses of scripture, but boy, what verses they are. They are absolutely magnificent. And for us, we have to go slowly through these verses, one at a time, making sure we understand one verse, then on to the next. For those of you who've been with me during this course so far, you should find no problems. For those who haven't, you may have to go back over the past tapes. However, we're going to take it slowly and we're going to see what the Archangel Gabriel said to Daniel. I'll tell you this, it must have caused Daniel's hair to stand on end and his eyes to absolutely pop out of his head. Really must. All right, verse 24, and let's start. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Now, first of all, can I say this? Notice what it says. They are determined upon thy people. Who are they? They're the Jews. It's not the church that's being talked about here. It's the Jewish nation. And upon thy holy city. What's the holy city? It's Jerusalem. So, the whole of this vision concerns not the church, not beloved believers in Jesus Christ, absolutely, definitely not. This is long before the church came into uh, existence and certainly into man's knowledge. 
It concerns the Jews and it concerns the land and it concerns specifically Jerusalem. All right. And he says, 70 weeks are determined upon them. Now, we run into a problem absolutely instantaneously. And the problem is, well, it's a nice little word, weeks. And in English, we think we know what it means. A week? Well, that's easy, from Monday to the following Sunday, right? Seven days, that's what a week is. And so, we read into that what we already know. So we say, right, 70 weeks are determined. But we've got to stop at that point because we have to look at what the Hebrew says here because if we take it just as 70 weeks, you run into awful, awful problems. Let's take the Hebrew. The Hebrew for the word week is the word S-H-A-B-U-H. Savua, uh, A, that is at the end, that's right, Savua. S-H-A-B-U-A. All right, Savua. And do you know, the word Savua simply means seven. That's all it means. It has nothing to do with days, years, months, or anything. It is the word seven. And we can forget about days and we can forget about years when you see the word Savua. It simply means seven. The mathematicians, by the way, of Daniel's day, if they wanted to multiply anything by seven, they used this word. So three times seven was three week, or three Savua. And it's as easy as that. So what does it say? It says this, 70 sevens are determined upon thy people. And there is no indication here what period of time is being referred to, whether it's days or whether it's years. If you just go across the page to Daniel 10, you'll see it's very different in Daniel 10. In Daniel 10 verse 2 and 3, look what it says. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. And then, in verse 3, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now, in that passage, the word savour is used, but it actually says in Hebrew, literally, savour of days. So, it's three sevens of days there. Now, the reason it's not years is that no one at all could fast for 21 years. And so it's clear. It's full weeks or whole weeks. There it is, savour of days. In Daniel 9, there is no qualification on the word savour. It just says sevens. The reason for that is because it is both days and years that are important. Now, let's take the days first. First of all, 70 times 7 is 490. And it's not specified. Let's just take it as days first. Now, 490 days is about a year and a third. And this is the answer that Daniel wanted to hear. He asked, Lord, I know it's in the next year or so that the, 70, sorry, that the captivity is coming to an end. But Lord, exactly which day is it coming to an end? And God said, well, he says, Daniel, it's 70 sevens. That's what it is. And if you take that as days, that's 490 days, and Daniel, from this time on, could work out exactly the day that the captivity was coming to an end. Now, that's marvellous. The problem is, however, that when you read on in these, these verses, you see that what is referred to here has much greater significance than just the Jews coming back into the land. And so we have to then say, okay, now that's the days aspect. What about the years aspect? Now we come to 70 sevens of years. 70 times 7 is 490 years. And here is the staggering and amazing thing. Gabriel actually says to Daniel, listen, Daniel, the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem have 490 years of history to come to them. 490 years. Now you imagine it. Here's the beginning of the period. You go along 490 years and there's the end of the period. That's it. And the, ar the Archangel Gabriel extends the prophetic horizon by 490 years. All right. But he then says what is going to happen at the end of the 490 years. You've got 490 something or other years 
determined upon thy people, and look what's going to happen. Six things. One, two, and three all relate to sin. Four, five, and six all relate to God's plan. Right, now let's see, let's see what they are. Verse 24, Seventy sevens are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Number one, to finish the transgression. Isn't that lovely? In other words, you Jews have sinned against me, but in just 490 days, it's all finished. Number two, to make an end of sins, so that I will count them absolutely no more. And number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Now those three have to do with sin. By the way, it's a lovely answer to Daniel's prayer, because you know the three Hebrew words used here are the three that he used when he was confessing the sin. If you just quickly go back to verse 5, look what he confesses on behalf of the people, children of Israel. It's the same three words, although in the King James one of them is translated slightly differently. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. And what does God say? say? He says, listen, he says, Daniel, in 77s, the iniquity is going to go, the sin's going to go, and you'll be reconciled. It's all finished. Praise God. We know, of course, that it, he wasn't just talking about the Jewish sins, he was talking about the sins of the whole world, actually. All right, but there's the first three. Now have a look at number four, five, and six. And these are amazing claims. He says, number four, after 77s, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Everlasting righteousness. In other words, the day is coming when every judge will give righteous judgment. When every policeman is going to judge every situation completely correctly. Absolute everlasting righteousness. When people actually will walk around and they will have a demonstration of righteousness everywhere they go. And that's what's going to be brought in at the end of this 490 period. Absolutely staggering. Number five, to seal up the vision, and it's not prophecy if you're in the King James, it's prophet. To seal up. Now I wonder what that means. Well the word seal up means to shut up, to close. And he says at the end of 77s, guess what's going to happen? Prophets are going to shut up and the visions are going to shut up as well. Now why does he say that? I'll tell you why. Because what the things that they had seen visions about and the things that the prophets have prophesied about will have come to pass. And therefore you don't need a prophet and you don't need a vision in those days. Why? You just have to open your eyes and there's the vision in front of your very eyes. Praise God. That's what he's saying. Quite a staggering claim, this, at the end of 77. And then the, the last one, number six, and to anoint the most holy. The most holy refers to the temple, and here he says, at the end of this time period, the final place for worship is going to be established. Now there are six amazing claims. All right. Now that's all that that says. Now let's, uh, let me just draw it up again and uh, let's understand it. In terms of the days, he's talking specifically about the Jewish captivity, but it's the one connected with the years that affects us. The angel Gabriel says there will be a period of 490 years it will begin at a certain point, it will end at a certain point, but when it ends, sin will have been dealt with, iniquity will, will have been dealt with, reconciliation for everyone will have come in, which is uh, quite staggering. There will be righteousness everywhere. There will be no more vision or profit, because the perfect thing will have come. The word of the law will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea in those days, and the final place for worship will have been established. Now that's quite some claim. You notice, by the way, we live after, long time after, 490 years after this was given, and we still do not see the last three in operation. So we know there's more to come. Before we go on to the next verse, verse 25, could I just make one little point? The principle we need here is the principle that we saw when we talked about what really happened on the day of Pentecost. 
Now, do you remember that particular Bible study? Do you remember that Joel had prophesied wonderful things that were going to happen on the day of Pentecost, A.D. 33? Oh, he said there are going to be signs in the heavens, wonders on the earth. It's going to be tremendous. You're going to prophesy, you're going to dream dreams, you're going to see visions. And Peter actually quotes it on the day of Pentecost. But then do you remember, we looked at the day of Pentecost and what did we see? There weren't any signs in the heavens. There weren't any signs on the earth. No one prophesied as far as we know. No one had a vision and no one dreamed dreams. Instead, they all did something that Joel never spoke about. They all spoke with tongues. And on that particular tape, you'll have to listen to it to find out what it's about, we understood why. And do you remember the reason it didn't come was because when the day came for God to fulfill his word through Joel, the Jews were in status quo rebellion. They were out of fellowship as far as God is concerned. And the same principle applies here. What the archangel Gabriel is saying is these things will come in if you Jews are in fellowship at the end of the 490 years. Now, of course, God knew whether they would be or whether they wouldn't. And, of course, Moses could have had a good guess as well. And we can guess also. And actually, the truth is that when the 490 years came to an end, the Jews were out of fellowship. However, that's jumping the gun a bit. Let's go to the next verse, verse 25. Now, I'm going to read this through, and then we'll take it section by section. Know therefore, and this means to know in the depth of your being and to know from experience. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. Three score and two is sixty-two. And sixty-two sevens. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And, of course, most Christians look at that, they read it, it's just a blur in front of their eyes, and they skip on to the next verse. Well, we're not going to do that. Now, it's quite easy. Let's take it just a section at a time. All right, what the angel is doing here is he is actually going to give the starting point of the period of 490 years. Let's read it. Know therefore and understand that, and here's the starting point, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Do you see that? It has to do with the restoration and the building of Jerusalem and absolutely nothing else. Now this is prophetic. Remember that when Nebuchadnezzar marched into Jerusalem, he left a pile of rubbles, rubble when he marched out in 586 BC. He destroyed the whole place. The temple was utterly destroyed. It was a scene of total devastation. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 4, says it was just waste. It was like a rubbish tip. That is description of it. Now here is a prophecy. And Gabriel says the day is going to come when someone is going to make an order. Go and rebuild and restore to its former glory the whole city of Jerusalem. Wonderful. Now for us, it's crucial to know when that decree was made. And so we have to look through the Bible and we have to see which decree was it that applies at this particular point. Remember, it's connected with the rebuilding of the city. Now there are four possibilities and we're going to go through them and we're going to see which one is the correct one. The four possibilities are these. There was a decree by Cyrus. This is King Cyrus the Persian. He made the decree. There was a second decree by a man called Darius. He was a Persian and not the one in the beginning of Daniel 9. The third one was given by a man called Artaxerxes Longimanus. I better spell that, I think. A R T A X E R X E S. Artaxerxes Longimanus L O N G. I-M-A-N-U-S. Longimanus, by the way, simply means long-handed one, right? And we call him, Artaxerxes, the long-handed, right? That's probably to do with how long his hand was, nothing to do with shorthand and typing, all right? I just say that. I don't know whether the typewriter had actually been invented in these days, but I will look it up and let you know. Now, Artaxerxes Longimanus made two decrees. Number three for us is the first decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus. 
but he also made another. And so number four is Art Long, Artaxerxes Longimanus' second decree. Now, it's absolutely crucial, because if we don't know which one of these decrees it is, we don't know where the 490 years begins from. And if we don't know where it begins from, we don't know where it ends. It's very important if we're dealing with prophecy. So, let's have a look, and it won't take us very long. Let's take them, and uh, let's see which one actually fulfills or foots the bill in this particular case. Now, to find these, you'll find them in the book of Ezra. If you turn to... Uh, the part of the Bible which follows directly on two chronicles, you will find the book of Ezra. All of those books are before Psalms. All right? Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther seem to be very difficult books to find. So I'll help you. Two chronicles, two chronicles, just at the end of two, two chronicles. Now, in chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, we get the Cyrus decree. Here it is. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a pro proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing. Now, there's a decree that saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven. Isn't that lovely? Cyrus is in heaven today, by the way. He was a believer. He was converted from idolatry. The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Jude Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the, the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. Is it to do with the city? No, it's not. It's to do with the temple. So, for us, it's not the Cyrus decree. So that's number one out. On to number two, which you will find in Ezra and chapter six. And we can deal with this one double fast. Ezra and chapter six, verse one, two, and three. Then Darius, the Persian, or Hystaspes, the king, made a decree and search was made in the house of the scrolls where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. And there he found at Akmitha, in the palace that is in the province of the Medes, a scroll. And therein was a record thus written. In the first year of Cyrus the king, the same Cyrus the king made a decree concerning the house of God. Ah, we need go no further. Actually, the Darius decree was simply a restatement of the Cyrus decree. And the Cyrus decree wasn't it, so that's number two off. Fairly easy. Right. Next one is the first decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus, and we find that in Ezra chapter 7, right? And verse 11, Artaxerxes Longimanus, first decree. Now this is the copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and at, at such a time, I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will, notice the emphasis on free will, by the way, to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. For as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counsellors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of thy God, which is in thine hand and to carry the silver and the gold which the king and his counsellors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. Do you know the Persians were very good to the Jews? They really were. And we have here another example of uh, their bounty as far as the Jewish nation were concerned. And all the silver and the gold that thou canst find in all the province of Babylon, with the free will offerings of the people and of the priests, offering willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem, that thou mayest buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs, with their meat offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. And if you just then go to verse 27, you see Ezra's response, and look what he says. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. 
And so we ask again, is this then to do with the restoration and rebuilding of Jerusalem? And the answer is no, it's to do with the beautifying of the temple. So number three is out. Well, that only leaves one, and you're absolutely right, it's number four. And we find this very quickly in Nehemiah, which is the next book along, and chapter two, where Nehemiah is a very sad man. And he's not sad about uh, silly things, he's sad about important things. This is Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning verse 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I, says Nehemiah, took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I'd done, I had not been before time sad in his presence. He'd always been filled with the joy of the Lord. He'd always been singing choruses in front of the king. But all of a sudden, he's very sad. Verse 2, Wherefore the king said unto me, Now hold on, this is unusual for you. You're always such a smiler. They call you smiler down in the court. This is most unusual, Nehemiah, he says. Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, because he thought the king would get so angry, saying, well, what on earth are you doing? You're supposed to cheer me up, you know, and have him put to death just to give him a laugh, you know. And so he's a bit nervous. Verse 3, and, the king, and said unto the king, let the king live forever, which is the way of preaching the gospel, by the way, in the Old Testament. O king, live forever, please, eternal life. And if he says, what do you mean, how can I live forever, then you tell him. Let the king <laughs> live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Now, what's he talking about, the temple? No. He's talking about the city. And here is the decree. By the way, this is 79 or 80 years after the Archangel Gabriel spoke about this decree. Praise God. Now that's good prophecy. And here is Nehemiah fulfilling the word of the Lord. Verse 4, Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favour in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. The king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? How long will you be away? And when without return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters, there's the decree, be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And so we see that this 490 year period begins with this decree found in Nehemiah 2. So we've got the starting point. It's the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes Longimanus. And you might think, oh great, so that's it then, marvellous. But I've got some bad news. And the bad news is this, that actually most Christians disagree about the date. In fact, people who've studied chronology all come up with different answers. I mean, they agree in batches, but there is perhaps 20, 25 years difference. And one has to be very careful when one is dating something like this, that you take only biblical information when dealing with dates. You see, many of these dates that, uh, say, the non-Christian chronologists use are, are based upon l uh, years of king's reigns given by uh, Egyptian scholars, Greek scholars, and unfortunately you can get two Greek scholars who disagree about the length of the reigns of the kings. And what they've done, they've uh, seen the one that they like the best and they've chosen that one. And it presents us with a problem. Well, the date I take is the one that Sir Edward Denny takes, all right, or took, and the one that is agreed by uh, quite a number of chronologists that this particular decree was given in the year 458 BC. 458 BC. A great Bible scholar called Sir Robert Anderson takes a slightly different date, but he comes to exactly the same conclusions from Daniel 9, and one day I'll do a special showing you what his point of view was. It's exactly the same conclusion, so it really doesn't affect the argument. Okay? But there's the beginning date. It is the year 458 BC. And can you see, by the way, doing a bit of arithmetic here, 
And uh, be careful, by the way, when you're dealing with years, because when you cross the 1 BC to 1 AD point, you have to make a correction of a year. I just throw that out. That probably is mind-boggling to some people. But you sit down, think about it, and you'll understand. Right? Take half an hour, because that's how long it will take you. But if we actually take the year 458 BC and we add on 490 years, we come to the year 33 AD. And, of course, we know what 33 AD was. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to wait till we come to that section. But can you see, there is 490 years from 458 BC going right through to 33 AD. Now, we've got the beginning part. All right, let's go back to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9, and we now understand the first bit, but let's read it again, verse 25. It's crucial to get this absolutely clear. Know therefore, and understand, that from the going forth of the commandment, this is Daniel 9, verse 25, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Right, we've got it. Now it says, unto Messiah the Prince. Aha. So we say, well, from 458, that's the beginning, and then we come through to the period of time connected with Messiah, the Prince. All of this end section here is the time connected with Messiah, the Prince. All right, so it, be it ends with the period connected with Messiah, the Prince. And look what it says. Shall be, and it gives a division. So let's draw up the divisions that it gives. First of all... It shall be seven sevens. Now there's seven weeks there. I'll actually write weeks in, even though it's wrong, and you know what I mean. There's seven weeks, which is a period of 49 years. All right? That's a small bit. And then it goes on and gives the next section. Shall be seven sevens, comma, and three score and two weeks, which is 62 weeks. Now, 62 times 7, if you can quickly do the calculation yourself, is 434 years. All right? And that's what you get. So, this verse says, now, it begins with 458 BC. It ends with the period connected with Messiah the Prince. But I'm dividing the time up, he says. The time is divided 7 weeks and 62 weeks. Now, will you notice this? that 7 weeks and 62 weeks comes to 69 weeks. And 49 years and 434 years added together come to 483 years. Now there, there are the divisions. All right. Now we know that the total time period is 490 or 70 weeks. So can you see, the time of Messiah the Prince must be seven years. Seven years. One week here, or seven years. Now let's just check that. We've got seven weeks and 62 weeks, which is 69 weeks. Then Messiah the Prince, one week, that's 70 weeks. And so that's absolutely right. Then you've got 49 years, 434 years, which is 483 years, plus 7 years, which is 490 years. So there's the period. Now, quite simply, it's saying that instead of the 490 years being one vast section of time, we've divided it up into three sections. The first of 49 years, the second of 434 years, and the last of 7 years. And the total is 490 years. Now, there it is. All right? Let's just read the last section and you'll see why it's been divided up. Now this is a bit difficult in the King James because they've mistranslated the last section. Unfortunate that, isn't it? However, and it says, the street, which will be, is actually the marketplace, the marketplace shall be built again, and the wall, which is the defence system, even in troublous times, and it makes it sound as if they're going to build, but they'll have a lot of trouble while they're building. It's not what it says. In troublous times is literally in the little bit or in the straight, the narrow bit of time. And what's it saying? It's saying that in the little bit, the seven weeks, the city will be completed. Now, it looks so complicated and yet it's really so easy. So he says, well, it's quite easy, but at the end of 49 years from 458 BC, the city will have been completed. 
That's it. And then he says, you've got another 62 weeks before you get to the period of time connected with the Messiah. Now that's it. Right, now, believe it or not, that's what verse 25 says. There it is. But it's really quite interesting that this one week is not actually named in this verse. And we will see why in just a moment. All right, now let's take this seven-year period and let me show you what it is. The dating of it is AD 26 to AD 33. There are the seven years of Messiah the Prince. And the, se the period of time, this is the last week, as it were, the last seven years, is divided in half. You've actually got the first three and a half years, which is when John the Baptist ministered. Now remember John the Baptist was part of the ministry of Jesus. He came and he prepared the way. And we know from Acts 19 that he said that the people should believe on the one who was coming after him. That is on Jesus Christ. So that's the first three and a half years. John the Baptist ministered for three and a half and was murdered. The last three and a half then is the actual ministry of Jesus Christ. And there you've got it. Now that is the last week as it is described. All right? There we are. Now, that is all verse 25 says. Now, the question is, why isn't this last week actually mentioned? The tragic truth is that when this time period had run its course and we came into the last seven years, the Jews were negative towards God. You imagine it. God sent his only son into the world, not to preach to everyone, just to one small nation. He walked on the earth, he proved himself by many miracles to be the Messiah, to be the King of Israel. He was coming with love and with grace and with miracles, and what did they do? They murdered him. That was it. At the end of the seven years, God's promises given in Daniel 9.24 should have been fulfilled. But the Jews were in rebellion to God. And so, here is what God did. Instead of throwing the Jews out, which he could have done, instead of throwing the Jews completely out of his purposes, do you know what he did? He simply said, well, they've rejected this seven years, I'm going to overlook those seven years, and I'm going to give them another seven years in which they will repent. Only instead of the next seven years that I'm going to give them, being years of love and of grace and of miracles, they are going to be years of tribulation and years of suffering and years of wrath. They haven't responded to my love, but they will respond to the judgment. And finally, they will get so downcast, finally they will get so beaten up that they will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will turn to the Lord and they will understand exactly what God's great purpose in salvation was all about. All right, now we, where do we see that? Well, that's verse 26. So, on to the next verse. Verse 26, And after threescore and two weeks, after the threescore and two weeks, in other words, after this period in the middle, sometime after, it says, Messiah shall be cut off, and King James says, but not for himself, which is literally, and he shall have nothing. So, they say, sometime after the completion of this time period, Messiah will be put to death. And God, in his foreknowledge, tells the Jews exactly what they're going to do to the Messiah. Do you realize, by the way, the Jews had no excuse for rejecting Jesus? For when Jesus started proclaiming he was Messiah, they could have turned to Daniel 9 and done a very quick and simple calculation to work out whether he was on time. And the dates would have proved, yes, Jesus was the Messiah. They had absolutely no excuse at all. They come through to this period and they put Jesus to death. The time uh, elapse is not given. It just says after the 62 weeks. We know it's seven years, simply because we know the total time period. But here, it doesn't mention that last week at all. God completely blinks at it, right? He absolutely closes his eyes because he wants to see the Jews saved. They have done terrible despite to the king of glory, but God blinks at the times of their ignorance. He's so gracious and so lovely. 
So, sometime after the three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, that is, he'll be killed, and he shall have nothing. He should have had a people, they wouldn't follow him. He should have had a kingdom, a geographical kingdom, and that didn't come either. He should have established a temple in Jerusalem, but they wouldn't hear of it, and they wouldn't listen. And instead, he had to say to the disciples, don't look at this temple. Not one stone will be left upon another. Don't look at it. And God did a miracle. Let me just draw out the miracle God did. All right, in diagrammatic terms. Here we've got uh, the period from 458 BC through to AD 26. Then you've got the seven years through to AD 33. And all God did was he overlooked the last seven years and he postponed them. How long has he postponed them? Well, they just jump over the church period, that's all, which is a mystery. You see? So it's quite convenient to do it. And so you've got dot, 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 dot. Here's the church. And you have a period then of seven years. Here is the last week coming through again. The period we call the tribulation, which will replace the first seven years. There's a lovely picture of this given in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. So let me just demonstrate it using the book of Genesis. Turn to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis 41. By the way, this is probably the hardest prophetic passage in the Bible. So I give you great comfort from that. All right? And I, I hope you're staying with me. Genesis 41. And begin verse 1 where we have the dream of Pharaoh. Genesis 41 and verse 1. Now you remember this dream, don't you? It's the thing that got Joseph out of prison. And he dreams a dream and it's, it's very important because it's, it shows us the principle in these two periods of seven weeks. And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. And behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favoured kine and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow, seven very fat cows indeed. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favoured and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river. Right, the first ones are Texan cattle, and the second ones are Sudan cattle. Right? Can you imagine that? One, you can count the ribs, the others, you could plunge a knife in and still not hit the ribs. That's the type of thing. Verse 4, and an astonishing thing happens. Look at this. And the ill-favoured and lean-fleshed kine did eat up the seven well-favoured and fat kine. So Pharaoh awoke. I bet he did. <laughs> Isn't that staggering? Seven lean animals eat up the seven fat animals and they come into one. And it wasn't bad enough just doing that. There was something else. There was another dream. And he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. Right? Absolutely excellent. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. There we are, same picture. And look what happened. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke and behold, it was a dream. Now what is it? It is God in his marvellous wisdom, and the Bible is so tremendous, actually giving a pictorial demonstration of what is going to happen between these seven fat years when John the Baptist and Jesus ministered and seven lean years when the Jews are really going to be hard-pressed. And you know what's going to happen? The seven lean years will eat up the seven fat years and at the end the Jewish nation shall be saved. Hallelujah. Marvellous. God's going to accomplish his great purpose even through tribulation. But who's it connected with? It's the Jews that it's connected with. All right, this also explains a scripture that you may not have understood in the Gospel of Matthew, by the way. Turn to Matthew 11, Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. All right? Now, a certain prophet called Malachi had prophesied concerning Elijah and concerning the Lord's coming. And he had prophesied this. He said, before the Lord comes, Elijah the prophet will come. That's what he said. And so, the people are all asking, well, is this Elijah? Is John the Baptist Elijah? Or who is he? Now remember, God knew the Jews would reject. And so, 
he sent John the Baptist in the place of Elijah the first time. And notice what it says, verse 13 and 14. All the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if ye will receive it, this is Elijah which was for to come. In other words, he's saying, if you believe on me, and if you accept me as your king, as your saviour, as your messiah, yes, John the Baptist is Elijah. But they didn't. And so what's the incredible thing? The incredible thing is that when the seven years are relived, Elijah's going to come back. And he will come. God's brilliant plan. You see, God is always the winner because he happens to know exactly what's going to happen at the end. Always the winner, God is. You'll notice he never decides things. He leaves it up to free will, but he knows which way the free will is going to go. And so he sent John the Baptist, and if you'll receive it, he says, then he's Elijah. But if you don't, Elijah's coming. And is Elijah going to come? Yes, he is. Let me give you previews of coming attractions. For in a few weeks' time, we'll be dealing with the characters of the tribulation, and we'll be actually going right through the tribulation, seeing the warfare, seeing what's going to happen in Jerusalem, seeing all the armies dashing across the land, and all the news coming from down north. We're going to see kings of the south and kings of the east dashing across country and all the rest. But one of the characters is a man mentioned in Revelation 11. Let me just turn to him. Revelation 11, I'm not going to comment except to show you who he is. Revelation 11, verse 4. These, he's talking about two witnesses that he's going to have. Verse 3, I mean, and I will give power unto my two witnesses. Now he gives a description of the witnesses in verse 6, and I'm only going to deal with one tonight. Look at this. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And who was it who in the Old Testament preached and then said, well, all right, I'm going to pray and God will shut the heavens and it's not going to rain for three and a half years, right? Who was it? It was Elijah. And who is the reference here to? Well, I mean, really, it's not a closed book, the Bible, is it? It's simply a book that interprets itself. And if you know your Bible, you have no trouble with that chap. It's Elijah. And I'm not going to tell you who the other one is, but look at the description of him. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood. <laughs> right, good stuff. Yes, and if you're looking at me all, well, I wonder who that is. Enoch? Might be Enoch. You know, if you're wondering, and it wasn't Daniel either, you better see me afterwards or wait for the tape. Right, back to Daniel 9. And let's go back to the deep waters that we're swimming in. Right, so verse 26 then says, at the beginning, after the three score and two weeks, sometime after, and it's seven years after actually, Messiah shall be cut off and he shall have nothing. Now, from the time that Messiah is cut off, we launch into the future. And all the rest of this prophecy has to do with things that occurred after AD 33. We launch right through into the future. And the second half of verse 26 was actually fulfilled in AD 70. In AD 70. By the way, if any of you are thinking, now hold on, I thought he said the church was a mystery. You know, I thought he said the church was never mentioned. Beloved, the church never is mentioned. But events that occur while the church is on the earth are mentioned if they relate to the Jews. That's it. Do you know that lovely passage which uh, is found in Luke 21, which talks about the day when all of Jerusalem will come under the power of the Jews again. Right? Now that's a Jewish thing. It affects the nation of Israel. It affects the city of Jerusalem and it's prophesied. When did that occur? When did all of Jerusalem come under the power of the Jews? It hadn't been under their power since the Romans had marched in. When did it come to pass? It was June the 10th, 1967 in front of our very eyes. But the church wasn't mentioned, has nothing to do with the church. It's the Jews that are mentioned, and Jerusalem that's mentioned. That's the point. And here, an event is mentioned which occurred in AD 70, which affects Jerusalem. Why? I'll tell you why. Because Jerusalem was destroyed, and the temple was destroyed in AD 70. And that's what it says. Look what it says, halfway through verse 26. And the people of the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And we look through history and there's only one date that it can be, it's AD 70. The prince of the people who shall come refers to the Roman soldiers, the soldiers of the Roman Empire. 
and they were under their, their general, a man called Titus. And Titus marched the troops in. Actually, it was Vespasian at first, but then he became emperor. Titus marched in. He surrounded Jerusalem and he waited for three years. And they battered and battered and battered at Jerusalem. And finally, in AD 70, the wall crumbled and in came the Romans. I want to tell you something, by the way. Here it says that the sanctuary would be destroyed. The temple would be destroyed. Do you know Titus gave his army instructions do anything you like, but don't destroy the temple. He actually told them, Josephus tells us, don't destroy the temple. Now, unfortunately for Titus, the word of God is more powerful than that particular general's command. And even though the soldiers were so careful, it was the feuding Jews inside of the temple who accidentally set fire to the place. <laughs> and up it went in smoke, absolute smoke. There was hardly a thing left. Right? There really wasn't. And you know, don't you, I've said this before, I think, in the last series, that all the gold melted and ran down the stones and went into the cracks. And we saw the word of Jesus fulfilled when he said, not one stone shall be left standing upon another. For in the years that followed, AD 70, all the Jews used to wander over the site, picking up stones to see if there was any gold in between the two stones. And within a few years, there wasn't one stone left standing on another. Everyone had been scoured at least ten times. You see, that's the miracle of God's mighty word. It is fulfilled absolutely literally to the letter, which is wonderful. Right, so this says, look, you're interested in the city of Jerusalem. You're interested in the temple. I'll tell you what's going to happen. After Messiah's cut off, the day is going to come when the whole of the city of Jerusalem will be destroyed. A.D. 70, Titus. There it is. And then it says, and the end of Jerusalem, it says, shall be with a flood. Aha, uh -huh. a flood. Now, when we think of a flood, we think of water. But when the Hebrews used the word flood, they thought of water and of an army, which was so huge in number, it just used to be like a tidal wave moving over the land. Right? We won't turn to the passage, but if you want to check that, turn to Daniel 11, verse 22 where a good translation of the Bible, like the NIV, translates it as a, a mighty army or a something or other army. It gives a description of the army, saying overwhelming army it is, that's right, an overwhelming army. And it says the end of Jerusalem will be at the hands of an overwhelming army, which is going to move in. And was it? Yes, it was. AD 70. Absolutely fulfilled. And then the very last part of verse 26 it reads like this, and unto the end of the wars, desolations are determined. It's not quite true. Actually, it says, and unto the end, cancel of, cancel thee, wars and desolations are determined. And he's saying that as long as there is a Jerusalem, which is always, there will be war and there will be desolation in its history. A good thing, by the way, for you who are interested in Jerusalem is to actually write out all of the wars that have affected the city of Jerusalem since AD 70. The list is absolutely staggering. It really is amazing. God's word fulfilled. Jesus said the same. There'd be wars, rumours of wars, but the end is not yet. In other words, it's going to be totally in trouble. It still is today, by the way. The West Bank is still erupting. We're still going to see trouble in Israel. And we must pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That is our responsibility as Christians. All right, there you go. Now, by the way, where's the church? Well, you see, the church has slipped in in the middle of verse 26. And actually is the whole latter part of verse 26. After the phrase, and he shall have nothing, or not for himself, there's the church. And it comes in there. And then we come through to the next verse, which is verse 27. All right? Now here is an amazing thing. When we look at the details of verse 27, we cannot see anything in history that actually shows this has been fulfilled. And when we see this, what does it mean? It means it is yet future. And here you've got a time which is coming and it is the period we call the tribulation. And the details are marvelous indeed. Right? Let's go to verse 27. And he shall confirm a covenant, literally, with many for one week. And there you've got one seven again. And so now we're dealing with a period of seven years or one week, which is yet to come. 
Who is he, by the way? He now is the leader of Rome that's coming again. Not Titus, but the new leader of Rome. He will be a European. He will also be Jewish, racially, by the way, but he's going to be a European. And he will uh, look towards Israel, and he will say, well, he'll say, um, Israel, he'll call up the Israeli government, and he'll say, I, I want to make, make an agreement with you, right? That's what it means with a covenant, an agreement. It means a trade agreement, a defense agreement. And at the beginning of these seven years, this man, who is the leader of Rome, will ring up Israel and say, Israel, it's time we came into agreement together. And I want us to sign an agreement, right? Trade, defense, anything else that you want. And it says there, with many. That means with the majority. Do you know what it shows me? It shows me there's going to be terrible opposition to this in Israel. The Israelis are not going to like this. They'll just pass it by a majority. But I'll tell you, but there'll be some Hebrew believers in those days and they'll be saying, don't you do it. They'll be writing out Daniel 9 verse uh, 27. They'll be sending it to the Prime Minister of Israel saying, what on earth do you think you're doing? Look, this is prophesied. And they'll still go ahead. And the Jews will go around and say, look, it's disaster. It's terrible. What's going to come? Come on, please don't do it. But the majority, just the majority, is going to say, no, it's absolutely right. And it will go ahead. And it will be a covenant which lasts for seven years. All right, let's go on to the next section. And in the midst of the week, now what does that mean? After three and a half years. Now isn't this funny? This seven year period is divided into two halves like the first one. In fact, it's a mirror image of the first one. It's got the first three and a half years and the second three and a half years. And it says, in the midst of the week, he the leader of Rome, shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now let's have a look at that. In other words, it's saying, during this seven-year period, there will be sacrificing in the temple, oblations in the temple. But hold on, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. Yes, it was. It's still destroyed today. Yes, it is. But when this period of seven years comes, do you know what's going to happen? The temple will be rebuilt. And I think this is part of the agreement made between Israel and the Roman leader. He will actually say, well, look, you give me trade, I'll give you defense, and by the way, if you want to rebuild your temple, I'll support you. Right? Doesn't matter about what the Arabs think. I'll support you. And they'll actually go and they will rebuild the temple. We don't know how long it's going to take them, but by... Uh, by the center part of these seven years, by the middle area of seven years, they are already making sacrifices to the Lord God of Israel in the temple. And the whole of temple worship has started again in the middle. And they think it's marvelous, except for the believers. The true Bible believers will say, oh, this is terrible, you know. And the others will say, I thought, you call yourself Christians? You call yourself your believers? And you're not even coming? When did you last come to the temple? And they'll be talking in that type of language. And the believers will stay out. They'll be watching, you see. And it says, in the middle, in other words, after three and a half years, the leader of Rome comes into Israel and he says, oh, by the way, the temple is magnificent, but I'm going to stop you sacrificing to your God. And he will then close down the whole temple to the Jewish religion. And do you know what he'll do? He will actually put up a new religion which worships him. Here is the old Roman emperor again. And he will use the whole of the temple for a heathen type of worship. Now, where do we get that from? In the next section. Now, could I say, verse 27, the end of verse 27, is extremely difficult Hebrew indeed. So, let me take the section, which is halfway down verse 27, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Let's take those words. The first one is abomination. I always think of Mike Ely when I hear the word <laughs> abomination. Because he prays a lot about abomination, and quite right, by the way. Abomination. Abomination was used of idols and idolatry. Idols and idolatry. So we know, therefore, that an abomination is going to be seen in the temple that's coming in Jerusalem. An idol. All right, but what is this word overspreading?
Now, literally, it means a wing. W-I-N-G. A wing. But it was the word used of a pinnacle of the temple. Right? The temple, after all, was a beautiful structure, and it had certain towers on the outside. And the word overspreading means a pinnacle of the temple. So, let me give you a literal translation for those of you who've got a King James version. If you've got an NIV, it's approximately correct. Here it says, And on the pinnacle, that is of the temple, on the pinnacle, abominations which make it desolate. On the pinnacle, abominations which make it desolate. Now, in the ancient world, when a person, an army, marched into a foreign country and they took over the temple, they always rededicated the temple to their own god. And how they did it was this. One, they used to set up a, a statue to their idol in the holy place of the temple. But the second thing they did was they used to put an idol on the outside of the temple on one of the pinnacles, the highest point, so that everyone would know this temple has now been rededicated. And what it says is that in the middle of the tribulation exactly the same thing is going to happen. This man will walk in, he'll say, well, you can stop all of your Jewish sacrifice. He'll put up an idol in the middle of the temple, and he'll put an idol on the outside of the temple as well. And here it says, on the very pinnacle of the temple, there will be an abomination which will cause desolation in the land. For this will be the beginning of the last half of the tribulation, which is a time of persecution, the like of which the Jews have never had before. There it says. Okay, so, on the pinnacle, abominations which make it desolate. And then it says, this will continue even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolator. And that says, for three and a half years, this terrible situation is going to last until finally God moves in and he judges the leader of the Roman Empire. God will save the day, finally. Now, there is the prophecy of Daniel 70 weeks. It is a period of 490 years, but the last seven years have been overlooked and have been delayed through to a period we call the tribulation. Is it to do with the church? Definitely not. It is to do with the temple, the sacrifice, the land of Israel, and the city of Jerusalem. All right, now we've seen that. Let me just go to Matthew 24 and where we've been before, and let's understand Jesus' words. Matthew chapter 24, and I'm going to begin verse 14. Verse 14. And this gospel, says Jesus, of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And look at verse 15. And when therefore ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, and in brackets, let whosoever readeth, let him understand. And the reason Jesus said that in parenthesis was because this is some of the hardest stuff to understand in the Bible. And so he says, when I say these things, don't just take my words and overlook them. Understand what I'm talking about. And that is why Jesus himself uh, tonight blesses such a Bible study as this. For we are understanding exactly what he was talking about. How many Christians there are who've read Matthew 24 and have never understood what the abomination of desolations is. They've just overlooked the whole thing. Well, look, it's a warning. Notice he takes Daniel 9 verse 27 literally. He doesn't say it's spiritual truth. He says, when you see it, then do something. He doesn't say, uh, you know, this... He goes on to interpret what it means. He doesn't do that and say, well, when he says, of course, the, on the pinnacle of the temple, uh, an abomination which causes death, he doesn't mean a statue or a real pinnacle. No, what he means is man's pride. When you see man's pride really getting up, then flee to the mountains. No, he doesn't mean flee to the mountains. What he means is... He doesn't do that type of thing. He takes it absolutely literally and he says, the day will come, you Jews, when you will see it. Now from AD 33 to AD 70, they never saw it. Today there's no temple. 
Does that mean the word of Jesus will not be fulfilled? Definitely not. It will be fulfilled when? It's going to come. The time is coming, and it may not be too far away now when they will see the abomination of desolations on the pinnacle of the temple. And he says, in the holy place inside as well. When you see it, he says, I've got orders for you believers. This is in the middle of the tribulation after three and a half years. It's been pretty tough up to now for those believers. They've been hated by everyone because they've refused to accept the Roman Empire and what the leader of Rome has said. Now it gets worse. And Jesus said, the day it's hoisted up onto the pinnacle, the day it's put in the temple, here are your marching orders. You believers, he says, here's what you must do. Then, verse 16, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Don't stick about, he says. Don't stand around. It's time to get going. Let him which is on the housetop, which is in the garden, by the way, because they had their gardens on top of the housetops. You who've got bulbs coming up, he says. You who are afraid that your cabbages, you know, well, I'll stay around till I... We may as well take some provisions with us. And the sweet corn is just about out. We might as well wait, he says. Look, you people are on the housetops. You get going, he says. Let him not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Urgent days. And woe unto them that are with child. Why? Because they have it, they'll find it hard to move fast. And to them that give suck. Why? Because it takes so much energy when the babe is still on the breast. Woe to them. But pray ye, he says, that your flight may not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Verse 21, for then... When you see the abomination of desolations, then there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. That is the word of Jesus. Beloved, is it a warning to the church? Definitely not. What's the, what's the words to the church? Therefore, comfort yourselves with these words. Jesus is coming for his church. Look up and see him coming. Expect the blessed hope. It's not a blessed hope, you know, to expect to see a pinnacle covered with an idol and then you've got to rush to the hilltops. That is not a blessed hope. And it's not the blessed hope of believers. No, no. You won't have time, beloved Christian, to go into the house to collect your clothes. You won't have time to collect your produce, for we shall not all sleep, but we're all going to be changed. Hallelujah. And God's going to give you a brand, new, uh, um, a brand new set of clothing, glorious light pouring out of your body. You will receive a new mansion, which he is at this moment preparing for you, a glorious resurrection body. Hallelujah. That is what's coming to you. So don't please stack up piles of tins, right? And don't please make sure your favourite cereal is in a cave somewhere in Weet I was going to say in Weetabix land, in Judea. Honestly, you beloved Christians will not be going there. You will be straight up into heaven, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Next week, I'm going to, t next time, I'm going to talk about the rapture of the church and we will bring our studies on the, the Christian and the tribulation to a close then. May I just close very quickly by saying this. We have certain figures in front of us. We have seven years. We've got three and a half years. Let me translate three and a half years into months. Three and a half years equals 42 months. And 42 months equals, in biblical years, 1,260 days. I say that to help you in your Bible study. For when you are reading the book of Revelation and come across 42 months and 1,260 days, you are dealing with one half of the tribulation. And you will know exactly, therefore, where your thinking is to go when you study that particular section of the book of Revelation. Well, it's been a marathon tonight, but an important one. The essential thing is to go away and study these things until they become your own revelation. For the Christian, we need not fear the future, for he's got it all in his hand, and his plan will surely come to pass. God bless you all. Amen. Praise God.